Greetings and welcome everyone. I am Alba Kecha, the Portfolio Manager for Risk and Management at PECB. I am excited to introduce to you today's topic of Six Sigma Business Continuity Management and Risk Management, a closer look on the relationship between frameworks, tools and techniques. The discussion will focus on the following objectives. Briefly uh, internalize the involved frameworks, the risk management, the business continuity and Six Sigma, and appreciate the synergy and its value to the organization. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to today's presenter by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control pan panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the question and answer session at the end of the today's presentation. Now, without further delay, I would now like to introduce to today's speaker, Joshua uh, Ray Alberina, which is a leading PCB certified ISO 31000 risk manager in the Philippines. Currently, he is a senior consultant for ISO programs of SAS management. His areas of expertise are sustainability practices, organizational resilience, business ex excellence, and IT practices. We'll return the time to Joshua now. Thank you for your attention and enjoy the session. All right. Uh, thank you, Alba, for the introduction, and uh, good uh, good day, everyone from uh, from around the world. Um, it's rainy day. It's a rainy evening here in Manila, so um, I hope you have yourselves a cozy coffee session there in your in your desk. Meanwhile, um, may this be an opportunity for you guys to be oriented or get to know more about the synergy behind uh, these three frameworks. This might sound an unusual topic to talk about, but at least this was something be uh, sort of a a pen, a pen idea or a bench idea that um, organizations, uh, practitioners, or consultants that may also recognize that uh, the value of the frameworks, despite the fact that they have common grounds, the point of these frameworks must have some value to the organization, particularly in the way they execute these practices. So for today's session, and in, re in relation to risk management practices, we are going to talk about these three popular frameworks. Of course, um, to create a sense of direction for this workshop, we are going to talk about um, these objectives that you're seeing on your uh, on the slides. So briefly, and in the, in, to manage also the time as well, and of course after this webinar I would be very glad to entertain your questions. So feel free to send an email address to me after this webinar as I'm very sure it's not going to stay, uh, it's not going to be staying that long in this discussion. So. What's going to be discussed over this 30-minute uh, huddle is basically to first um, acquaint ourselves uh, quickly with these three frameworks um, on risk management, BCM, and Six Sigma, and then, and then understand the unusual synergy of these frameworks, and or should we say an unusual combination of these frameworks, and what does it represent to the organization? Well, will it going to be give the, realize the benefit, or is it going to reduce the risk, or is it going to add more risk, or is it going to be a huge investment to the organization in such a manner that it's not going to be a reasonable uh, point? So that we're going to be discussing in detail. Although, be advised that as much as the idea is more of of a, is, is more on understanding the synergy. There will be several perspectives that will be discussed on this unusual, uh, on this synergy. So it would be very nice if you're going to send me an email commenting or saying a thing or two, it would be very much appreciated. After all, this is the reason of webinars and exchanging knowledge. And um, we're going to share in what way and in what way, as practitioners, can thoroughly improve how we execute these practices back to the shop floors. So that will be the company, the discussion of uh, this 30-minute webinar. So let's get started. Now, operational excellence, that's the, that's the penchant for this program and what we call a Six Sigma. And as you know, PECB has a, has a very unique way of um, bringing out Six Sigma to the floor. And something that you have to check in with, uh, with, uh, with us, uh, PECB as well, on what's in it for this course and as much as there's a nice counter part for it but nevertheless at the at the end of this uh, uh, we recognize that six Sigma is actually a has two methodologies and particular to this context we will be addressing major majorly on the process improvement which is the DMIC framework and a bit about the DMADV but literally speaking um, as six Sigma as it is so 
to briefly discuss what is Six Sigma. It's actually a methodology for continuous improvement. I even have to add this also. Uh, oh yes, it's already in the deck by the way, that it's also a methodology for creating products, processes that perform at high standards. And I will literally say that it is indeed at high standards considering the, the nature of this practice which is basically data driven, uh, results driven, and process driven. So exactly what ISO 9001 is also ex uh, requiring each organization to perform. Uh, if you can check it at around class number 8 of 9001, you should be able to see that it has a level of detail that requires also a proactive approach for the organization. And to help the practitioners build up their knowledge about Six Sigma, this, the Six Sigma as a topic in itself, since its inception in Motorola in 1994, it's actually also a compendium of statistical and quality tools. And the majority of, and most of our practice here, most of our participants here in our trainings, uh, get all gets always shocked at the numbers. And I always say to them, hey, it, this is Six Sigma, and this is really process improvement by the numbers. If you want, and literally speaking, if you are, if you want to do a quality management practice that is, um, that provides a reasonable level of results, then you have to put it on numbers. More or less, somehow this practice, this practice, hits straight to the point, and. As this is a set of, uh, this is a, a life cycle, or so to say, it has, it's a framework which has uh, DMA IC for process improvement in a DMA DV. It's also more or less saying a quality philosophy and a management technique. But um, needless to say, there are some things that we need to know, be aware about Six Sigma. And that is something that uh, every organization needs to understand. And how can it bring to the organization, particularly in the way they optimize uh, their processes or enhance their products based on, uh, based on the context and the interest of the stakeholders. So with Six Sigma, there's much to work for. And that is, uh, that is it for this practice. Moving, and specifically, um, going a little bit deeper on Six Sigma, let's talk about the DMAIC, which is the Process Improvement Methodology. It has a five um, five steps. So for those who are not familiar to this practice, consider this as a way of uh, giving a level of awareness. So when you talk about process improvement, we start with these five steps. We first define, uh, the first step is define. And talking about this phase, it's in a nutshell, it's more like asking um, the organization, what does the client need that I need to improve? Or what does the client need that I need to develop for a new product, a new service, or a retrofitted process, or an improved set of activities that, I, that my client need based on, their, based on the business requirements, uh, based on their customer requirements that will eventually become a business requirement. So typically an output for this phase would, would be a formal, uh, a formal statement that this is the need, we are going to do this one, and this is the way, uh, these are the things that's going to happen, and these are the measure, uh, these are the measure watch points that you can tell that we are doing exactly what should be done. That is in the defined phase. Now for the measure phase, this is more on the process in numbers. So when you define the process, you need to collect the data. So you need to understand what are these data types that you need to collect, what are, is it qualitative or quantitative, and you need to measure that response variable as effective as possible. When we say effective, you collect that data I mean that you collect that data, validate it, or describe the pattern of it, and assess if I am really correcting the right data, and tell me at the end of this practice, is it capable of delivering that process? So that is the level of detail on this phase, for measure phase it is. Now, once you understand the whole parameters, or the param parameters of um, the process, from from sketch to numbers, then you try to understand what is the root cause of these anomalies? Why do they exist? Why is it what's going on? And I need to understand that precisely so that in order for, for me as a process owner 
could develop ways and means to start to define what are the things that should be done. That's actually an analyzed phase. So it's more actually, it's more like saying assessment because it's a combination of analysis and evaluation. And in this point, you are going to define what are the key process input variables and other possible variables that will create a change to improve your process based on you have based on what you have defined and what you have measured so as soon as you have defined them in detail it's time for you to uh, define what are the, the steps to thoroughly improve your process and that is in the fourth phase to establish the improvement options and once, in, once improvement options are established, then you have to make sure that it sustains and regular and literally speaking, um, keep the pro, keep those uh, variations at bay. So in and in order that the process will smoothly run, regardless of what would be these anomalies, and that is the DMAIC, literally in a nutshell. Which for some training organizations, this will take around two months up to six months, uh, two days up to six months of an intense training. And of course, you need to collaborate with your uh, master black belts or black belts on how you uh, how does a process in improve using this methodology. This is a very interesting area, by the way, and this would be also some, some way of uh, looking, on a, looking on the process in a different view. So that is Six Sigma in a nutshell. Now, moving forward, next is the enterprise risk management. While Six Sigma focuses on reducing the variations in the process, on a different level, risk management is more on addressing uh, thoroughly addressing and thoroughly studying the the process or activities or business uncertainties. So literally speaking, it's actually anticipating uncertainties. Might be wondering why am I explaining uncertainties when it is risk? If you listen, if you were able to trace on Advice of Guide 73 on risk, it says effective uncertainty on objectives. So to say it in a different way, it is to which that, that, that matters should be the first thing that should be given attention to. So that is actually enterprise risk management. And specific to ISO 31000, it has um, it is designed to take risk assessments in a very systematic approach, or in a different way of saying, it is to address uh, uncertainties, anomalies, or unbecoming events, or something that I cannot, uh, something that organizations cannot predict what should happen in a very systematic approach. This protects organizations from any un, uh, from any uncertainties that can happen, whether regardless of the size and regardless of its duration. And if you can see it on your screen, this is as a framework excerpted from the ISO 31000. So if you can see here from, uh, from the first box, we have the principles. Literally, um, if you can follow this from left to right, uh, this, is a, uh, this is a very clear pattern and more or less an effective way to really sustain risk management in the organization. We have also faced with this question that how can you effectively measure risk management? It's plain and simple. Because it is a risk management, uh, it, it's a risk management framework. You can effectively measure it because, as you can see here uh, on the second block, that's the framework. Four point two talks about monitoring and reviewing the framework. So definitely there would be uh, metrics in place or indicators or critical success factors to establish, to effectively check if your risk management framework has met the necessity, uh, the necessities that an organization requires, which is to harmoniously align with the standards or if not aligned with the standards, has provide the value that the business requires in a means of addressing uncertainties which follows that as it is a management framework, then what are the things that I need to manage? That is actually addressed in the third section or the third block that is risk assessment. So as you can see here, this is nothing new as you can see the directions of the arrow from establishing the context followed by a three-step procedure of the assessment which is identification, analysis, and evaluation. If you're able to follow my previous webinar on risk assessment techniques, this risk assessment can come in a very different 
uh, coming a unique approach because you you may not be faced with just the standard preliminary risk assessment technique. There are many ways to identify, there are many ways to thoroughly analyze, there are many ways to thoroughly evaluate risk asset, risks in the organization. The question or the situation would be, or the challenge point is, what are the what is the context of the organization? That's why it comes first before you do the assessment, and then eventually you have to do some risk. Uh, you have to address them in a form of defining what would be the strategy based on the identified risks. So from enterprise and from strategy until uh, process levels, this is um, more or less the the sequence for risk management for an organization, and then specific to risk treatment that is in clause 5.5. What's here is strategy and we all know that at the end of doing this you are compelled to define a risk treatment plan. Now we all know that there is a, there is a corresponding standard to to anticipate uncertainties, particularly those that create an impact and that is where the next framework which is business continuity management will exist. Now particular for ISO 22301 or the management system, uh, this, the, the standard on uh, business continuity management system. This is a framework or this is a standard that centers on ensuring resilience um, resilience in the organization from process to products and the way the organization communicates across its stakeholders. In short, it centers on identified business impacts and and time and again, it may have it may need some support with risk assessment techniques to address threats and its frequency. That is business continuity management, and so these, in general, are the three frameworks that uh, that any company can ever uh, think. Uh, that is also popular in the organization, whether it is uh, just by BCM or whether it's a Six Sigma, but nevertheless. Um, uh, in, in lieu of the recent requirements, uh, mandates of the ISO standard, risk management will, is already slowly picking up some pace on all enterprises. Now the, now, the thing, now the real part begins, is we understand the synergy. For any organization, the purpose of why they exist is based on the need of the stakeholders. We all know that one. So the reason why they exist is more of a value creation. So when we talk about value creation, it's how about how they deliver the products or how they deliver the services to the organize uh, to their respective customers. So we might wonder, okay, we're going to deliver that one, but connecting to this discussion, what are the things that are in common? What are the what are the similarities? What are the differences? Or literally speaking, what is the synergy behind it? So let's get started by looking on the organization in particular. On, an, on a regular basis, regardless of the interval, any organization will have to thoroughly, time and again, look for these uncertainties. I'll at the same time, deliver the re, uh, normally deliver the business as expected from their customers who are also apparently their stakeholders as well. So time and again, uncertainties will have to come, whether in, whether, and then they come in different sizes or in different extents. So an art, that being said, and that is the reason why the ISO community really put in clause number six as a very major requirement for all organizations because it, is, it explicitly addresses uh, uncertainties which are in, in general are non-conformities. So 6.1 and 6.2, although indirectly spoken, would somehow would require organizations to set up a risk management framework or should we say set up assessment techniques from which that, uh, that should be able to help organizations address these uncertainties, whether it is on a top level or in a process level or an activity level, literally everything within the organization. And if should there be an effective risk management framework, in black and white, they can explicitly define what are the threats and what are the opportunities. And regardless of how risks are identified, both ends will always present impact. So how? So the next question is, how can an organization address that? Well, risk treatment plans would be somehow create substance to address them perfectly. Eventually, it will be left by these two frameworks. So if you can look at it closely, all uh, by, uh, by, by looking at the nature of these frameworks, 
nearly all the threat-based impacts will be addressed by the business continuity management framework. It also makes sense because if you look at the if you look at the way how BCM behaves, it during the analysis part or in when you start the BIA, which is by which is if you look at the ISO 31010, it's actually one of the techniques there. But uh, specific to business continuity management, for you to establish a business continuity plan, you need to have a well-defined business impact analysis from which you need to define also business impacts. And business impacts comes from threats or even opportunities, but majority of which or should we say for, uh, for a clear definition, most of the things that are identified are threats and which are thoroughly identified when you have an enterprise risk management framework. Or even if you don't have, the most important thing there in a business continuity management is identify threats and its impact to the organization. That is thoroughly assessed in the BIA and properly sketched out its action plans in the business continuity plan and of course the incident response structure and how does the organization establish its strength of resilience will thoroughly be checked by testing and exercising, monitoring and measuring and auditing the entire uh, practice from which this leads us that in BCM you will be faced with four uh, major parameters that is uh, that represents an organ that represents that this measure has a level of importance to the organization and we are talking about the minimum business continuity with the objectives we are also talking about the um, the, the maximum tolerable period of disruption, this is MTPD, and we also talk about the recovery time objective or the RTO, we also talk about the recovery point objective or the RPO. Realize also that the two figures, the MTPD and the RTO, these are time-based figures from which it will require some level of um, quality or should, or, or should we say a level of accuracy and precision. And more on, on the perspective of business continuity, these pieces of information, um, especially if you have a business continuity plan in place, it might be or it will be that there will, there will be some changes, expected changes to business process. And this would be uh, more or less a suitable piece of information should the company have a process improvement measures in place. Of course, especially after thoroughly analyzing the process, you find these are the levels of, of improvement. What a process team would normally do or would can can do is inject also continuity requirements to the process improvement um, plans so that um, not only the process improves but also it becomes strength it becomes more resilient uh, because there are some pro there are some components in the business continuity plan which is defined by the BCM that will be substantial when uh, when it is considered as a factor in defining process improvements. When an organization implements a business improvement practice for say Six Sigma in this context. Now, on the perspective of process improvement or modification or product definition, uh, a company, especially when there's a strong structure of Six Sigma practice, um, and I, was, I would also say for any, uh, for any practitioners who are representing organizations, a good practice in Six Sigma will always follow a strong, uh, will always have to embrace uh, this practice, uh, the entire organization. So, say, literally speaking, um, literally speaking, we are talking about process improvements on a large scale. We are also talking about, um, we are also talking about, show for a minute, for a minute, please. Okay. So we are talking about, um, where am I? We are literally talking about how can the process improve for, um, how can the process improve, especially if it is well embraced by the, in, the entire enterprise from top management all the way down to operations. So if an or so say if an organization has already defined its Six Sigma practice, the inputs of the process improvement will also complement business continuity practice, especially in the way one defined its figures. 
that will also add as an as a piece of information to modify key metrics. So, like for example, if you want to uh, if you want to improve your process time or you want to reduce variations based on the specification limits from your uh, from your clients. So that being said, that will also create a level of um, influence to defining the RTO and MTPD because the process is so well is thoroughly defined and it will and it will sort of create a level of accuracy and precision in thoroughly defining your RTO and MTPD. What's even better is that if a company embraces reducing process the processes but with lean practice, it can reduce uh, which it's designed to eliminate the waste and reduce its uh, process time and increase the speed of the process. Because of the change of the process, it can also create an impact to modifying the process the the numbers. We're talking about the recovery time objective and the maximum tolerable period of disruption, which are key figures in business continuity management. And while I'm, talk I'm taking this from a process perspective, realize that business continuity management will also have to come on a large scale. And that being said, but uh, that being said, we're going to see some um, uh, delineations between strategic and uh, the strategy and the process and activities. And this is um, more or less the majority of the exercise are actually uh, delineated by these divisions. Now, by by per, by experience, majority of the organization sees risk management as a medium on the on the strategic level. So we're talking about executive level and the top management because these are sort of like uh, the eyes or the tower uh, moral eyes or uh, sort of overseers in giving the company a reasonable direction in in terms of um, in terms of where to go next and. A little bit of touch on how can they improve the operational levels and the process levels, but realize that in risk management it is so spinned off that it has it can also cater on the operational level, which is at, which is why on risk management frameworks there is also a an operational risk management or operational risk assessment uh, that deals risk day to day risks in uh, day to day uncertainties in the activities, and Notice on the other on the right side of this explanation, majority of the practices in business continuity, like for example, a process modification, infrastructure changes, um, security protocols, they're more or less at the process to activity levels. And changes in the process, majority are majority of which are in the operations. That's why if you notice, majority who takes up Six Sigma are those who are process owners, process specialists. So more of the nature of their practice are actually in process to operations, which is why business continuity management and Six Sigma are harmonious both in process and activity levels, from which the data generated from these activities will create a significant piece of information for those at the strategic level for those risk managers on the enterprise level to create sound sound decisions sound uh, directions based on data driven data based results and well defined resiliency measures and all of these are what's inside in an organization and eventually they create a they create enterprise value, not only within the organization, but also to the customers. Now, we are stuck, now we are left with this one question. What then is value to the enterprise? When you talk about enterprise value, simply put, it's about, define, it's about delivering what is uh, the benefit for the company, what, uh, what, uh, how, are, how risks are, are managed, and how the resources are optimized. So literally speaking, an organization creates value to its customers when these three points are met. And we see that actually inside this practice, um, face to, um, um, paper to paper or point to point. So for example, if we want to realize the benefits in the most reasonable cost, Six Sigma already addresses that. Now, when we want, and not only securing the cost for uh, securing um, the benefits, but also 
um, is establishing resiliency measures from which in terms of risk optimization or addressing uncertainties in the most effective and efficient way, we have now the business continuity management and enterprise risk management on a synergy, uh, in, in synergy, in harmony. Well, also a little bit more on Six Sigma as well. Now, in terms of resource optimization, the question would be, how expensive can this be? Depending on the, the urgency or depending on the necessity of the organization, they can either take on three or they can choose to pick which one is the most import, uh, most practical. Um, not all organizations would uh, would see this one, but if we want to create that value to our um, to the organ to the business, then there is uh, this synergy would somehow show its effect in in when if implemented effectively, it will create a reasonable amount of benefits to investors, to customers, to other stakeholders that might be involved simply because the process is harmonized or optimized and established with resiliency measures. All uncertainties are well addressed when you talk about enterprise risk management and all the, un all the threats that may come in the way in the organization from, from, from product-related, process-related to activity-related, it is what this, that is the function of a business continuity management. So literally speaking, we're seeing a resilience, um, a resilience to the organization. Now, at the, end, at the end, no matter how good this framework would be, how deep would the implementation become is dependent as to the management's decision, which is also based on, on the current context. That's why for all of these practices, the, no, the, the number one requirement for this, putting aside, or putting aside presenting the business case, is establishing the context. As you can see it in enterprise risk management on the, on, um, uh, like uh, clause number 5.4 of ISO 31000, you need to establish the context. And then in um, business continuity management, if you refer to ISO 22301, or even in the BCM life cycle, you see there um, con establish the context of the organization or in the in the six path life cycle that's defined. For Six Sigma, what you're asked to perform in the defined phase, you define the customer uh, and its need. So literally speaking, we have these with, uh, because they have common grounds, it's not far that they are working together. But realize there are also other angles of synergy at this point. I am coming from a process perspective and, and across the, the internal structure from strategic process to activities. And this, at the end of this discussion, I'm summarizing it all right in the sketch. So the ones on the left, or the table on the left, on process optimization, this is Six Sigma. The first top presents the frameworks. So for process optimization, we have the DMAIC and the DMADV. For risk management, we're talking about enterprise uncertainties. When you want to manage your risk, you need first to establish your risk management framework, and then eventually you manage how you assess the risk, which is the essentials of ISO 31. Of course, not, not to forget the principles, the 11 principles that serves as a guiding set of concepts needed by the enterprise to implement risk management. And finally, to address business impacts which are coming from threats, you have a BCM life cycle and that is, um, that is embraced by ISO 22301. Now, to thoroughly start the whole thing up, you will definitely need tools and techniques. So for process optimization on Six Sigma, you have this, what we call the Six Sigma toolbox. What am I referring to this? For measure, you have diff descriptive statistics, measurement system analysis, you have um, process capability measurements, and you will, and on analysis, you will have several techniques, cause and effect diagrams, uh, you will also have statistical analysis, you will also have um, multivariate analysis, is so many tools right there, even processful mapping. And in ISO 31000, in similar way as I've talked about the Six Sigma toolbox, are also the techniques that are also used in risk assessment. Realize that in doing risk assessment, uh, there are many techniques that you can select. Now, ISO has defined thoroughly about it in 31010, which you can check it when you have the time. And for business impact, is actually business impact analysis and risk assessment, the BIA and RA. These are the step, the, the foundations for defining business impact uh, measures. And this is a substantial uh, list and recognizing that these two activities are also derived from 31010. 
At the end of these activities, what, are, what is expected or what are the outputs that will come out? Now, for Six Sigma, you will have an improvement plan and control plan. Now, as I've mentioned in the synergy and moving forward, this can also be further refined when an organization uh, defines risk treatment plans and residual risk management. This is more like a, a, a complementary piece of information between, um, between Six Sigma, a process improvement, and risk management. And in connection with the business impact and BCM, you have you at the end of that activity, you will be thoroughly defining few of these many many requirements that BCM would need as the incident response structure, the business continuity plan, which already contains a lot of information, and then finally to thoroughly check the comprehensiveness of your plan, you have an exercise and test plan. You can also and how the quality of the tests and the plans that you've defined in business continuity will be as dependent as to how you define your process improvements and how uncertainties are well defined by these two previous frameworks that I have mentioned earlier. In summary, I'm concluding this lecture or this webinar with these uh, bullet points. Now, the synergy of frameworks actually uh, increases value in the entire context and to stakeholders, particularly in creating value. And um, when you create value, it's all about how we realize the benefit, reduce the risk, and reduce the cost. And if you notice also, majority of um, the, com the composition of how the frameworks are implemented presents reactive and proactive approaches. What do I mean by this? When you talk reactive, it's more like identifying uh, checking, monitoring, practices that where you're going to spectate. For proactive, it's more on defining the action plans. So for Six Sigma, for example, you need to define it's an improved phase. For risk assessment, for risk management, you have the risk treatment plan or the risk treatment options. For BC BCM, it's more you're drafting the BCP and testing it with exercise and test approaches. And at the moment, in reality, as organizations, I hope that they have recognized the synergy. The challenge for this is alignment, um, alignment to business and aligning to process more, or less, and then eventually harmonizing these frameworks. The, the advantage of this, reducing documentation, and then um, establish a level of uh, establish a level of connectivity and and a level of accuracy and precision across all informations, considering the nature of um, Six Sigma, which is data-driven and process-driven, risk management is more on uh, the more on identifying the current context, and BCM is more on what are the impacts and what can it bring to the organization. And I have explicitly summarized it across these three frameworks right here um, on risk management. And as you can see here, um, in risk management, it typically the nature of the practice. While we talk about the risk treatment plan, majority of which is more on the reactive side, it's more on identifying, analyzing, and evaluating. It's more like um, checking the whole thing up. For Six Sigma, it really is more on proactive side, but the nature of activity is more on. Um, it's more tedious. It's uh, actually. Um, it's all. It's a bit of reactive, but it's more proactive because, uh, especially the improved phase statistical process control on the activities will be very useful to reduce variations. Six Sigma is much more after on the aftermath of analyzing because that is where the real output begins. For business continuity, the focus is more on resilience. How can impacts be reduced and how can it be reduced further when thoroughly improved? And that's why BCM by nature is more proactive side, more proactive because the analysis part or the reactive side is already taken up by risk management. So that's why uh, that's why I gave this webinar, or I, I have I given this piece of information, so that we will be able to see the value these frameworks can bring to the organization. And if an organization would think of implementing this, they can consider first this phased approach that I can also recommend. First phase, they can take up a risk management. They can set up the risk management framework first because that is very important for them to know what are they dealing with from inside and outside. Second is to establish the process improvement works. First, focus on the opportunities. See where can they boost up their uh, boost up their business value by improving their process using Six Sigma. Third, to make it to make the enterprise more stable, the third phase could establish resilience measures, business continuity, and all other practice in it. That would somehow serve the synergy of all these frameworks. Now, I realize that they are unique in scope. 
but the synergy for the as an organization this is something that uh, something that they can really examine too so at the very end uh, regardless uh, regardless of which perspective you're coming in this webinar would uh, this webinar is open for interaction and what could be other angles of synergy that this three frameworks represent and and as and literally uh, as from uh, from our end and our experience coming from an industry perspective we've seen this frameworks consistently working time and again so that being said, I hope you got something from this webinar, and um, I'm open up to some questions. And I thank you a lot. Thank you very much to all for taking the time and listening to this webinar. Um, that um, I'm now open to questions. Um, Alba, um, you can take it away from here. Yeah, thank you, Josh. Uh, we're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, uh, uh, attendees can still submit question, questions through the question pane in your uh, attendee control panel. Uh, the first question is. Uh, why I, while I note diagram demonstrating the synergy between the three, I did not quite get the link between uh, enterprise risk management and Six Sigma. While the link between business continuity and enterprise risk management is rather obvious, could not, uh, could not the SWOT analysis be the main link? Please explain. Um, the SWOT analysis for Six Sigma and risk management, that, is, uh, that was the last piece of this uh, question, right? Yes, could the SWOT Alba? analysis be the main link? Yes, uh, the main link between Six Sigma and risk management if, uh, is actually more seen in the defined phase. If you notice in Six Sigma, in the defined phase, it's more like understanding the customers. Where are they coming from? What do they want from, uh, from the service services that the company quality function, uh, quality house, but what's also essential for these um, practices is also understanding the strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats that companies, uh, that, uh, companies should see. Not, not also, uh, I also forgot to mention the PESO analysis, or it's an acronym for political, economical, social, uh, technological, legal, and environmental, can also play a bit of a factor to enhance the SWOT analysis, which also helps us understand what do my, what my stakeholders or what my customers expect from me to improve my process. So that's uh, that's the synergy there between Six Sigma and risk management. Another is on the cause and effect analysis. This is actually in the analyzed space of Six Sigma, where the where the main target of this uh, activity is to understand the root cause of nonconformities. So if you can imagine, uh, if you can see there the tools and techniques being used in that section is, uh, let's focus on the qual quantita qualitative aspect. We're looking on the cause and effect, the fish bone, the bone, the failure mode and effect analysis. These are the tools that also use in risk assessment, particularly in analyzing, uh, in analyzing and evaluating on risks which are identified in the context of the organization, particularly on the in internal aspect. So I hope I got your question addressed right there, but I'd be, I'd be, I'd welcome to hear a follow-up question for this part. We have a follow-up question for the same person. Okay. Let's All see right. here. Uh, he says, I thought risk management is proactive in the sense that it is meant to address all impediments to uh, attainment of set business or enterprise objectives. It is indeed it is indeed proactive, but if you notice the nature of the of the activities in the risk assessment from identification, analysis, and evaluation, it's more on collecting the information. So if you realize the reactive side is more focused on collecting, identifying, and um, what would uh, what would be the consequences of which? Uh, this is more or less the reactive side. The proactive side is risk treatment. But if you look at the the company, if you look at the practices from on the risk assessment side, from identification, analysis, evaluation, and treatment, majority of which is more on the reactive side. Now, the risk treatment plan is an output of it. But uh, the, cru the, the crucial part in defining an effective risk treatment is how you, def how you assess 
the risk based on a given context. So that, that's why even if it is proactive, indeed it is proactive because any framework would be effective or any framework would not be literally popular if it's not a proactive one. But take a look at the concentration of the activities. It has a level of reactiveness. What that Six Sigma provides is, is uh, what Six Sigma and BCM provides are the proactive stances but more of a concrete proactive measures that risk management um, that that risk management is able to define so uh, that being said I hope I was able to answer the question as effective as possible thank you again Josh uh, because of the time limited mm -hmm. we'll now get just another question um, is for who okay, is Six Sigma training intended Six Sigma training good question Typically, Six Sigma trainings are intended for those who are in the process improvement regime. That's very popular for, uh, for those who are in that direction. But uh, if you look at it closely, um, Six Sigma focuses on modifying the current state of, uh, of one organization's processes to deliver its intended services. So we're looking also not only, um, not, um, not only into the main uh, area of the business, but also other key processes uh, that has sets of predefined that has predefined sets of activities. So, an example of which, say, for example, you are in a shared service company. It has around several uh, departments, which are the innate process enablers. So, the the fact that it has predefined sets of activities with specific outputs that would create uh, that would contribute to delivering the effective products or, uh, effectively the products and services of the organization then those who are inside there they are eligible to attend the Six Sigma training and of course on a professional level um, to, to, uh, to reduce the shock because most of those who attend in the training uh, especially if they're not really informed of what Six Sigma is will end up in shock so in order to manage that they got to attend there they have already some uh, bits and pieces of knowledge about quality management um, a level of mathematics or preferably statistics and um, a level of critical thinking that should be very important to any process improve uh, for Six Sigma as we all as, as as any pro training program can ever be defined. So there, I hope I answered your question. Thank you, Josh, for the presentation and for answering all our questions. Uh, and thanks to everyone else who attended this webinar. We appreciate you being here. I want to inform you that this webinar is also recorded and can be found in our website and YouTube channel. We'll, we will also send you the link of the webinar in your email in the upcoming days. Don't forget to check back on our upcoming webinars on topics of your interest. Thank you again for joining us today, and we will see you next time, same day at the same time. Thank you, Josh. All right, thank you, Alba.